When was the last time you heard a child referred to as obedient? It's probably been a while. That's too bad because the best research tells us that obedient children are happy children. And from my experience as a family psychologist, the parents of obedient children are happy parents. Since all parents want their children to be happy, the question becomes, how does one get a child to obey? Is there some trick to it? Well, there certainly are a lot of parents who think so. They believe that proper discipline is a matter of using the right methods, techniques, and strategies, what I call consequence delivery systems. Parents have been using these behavior modification-based methods since they became popular in the 1960s, seemingly to no avail. Would anyone argue that today's kids are more obedient than kids were several generations ago? I don't think so. The reason these methods and techniques don't work is that proper discipline is not a matter of proper methods. It's a matter of a proper attitude on the part of the parent. Let me illustrate the point. Let's say that for a week, I observe the classroom of a grade school teacher who has the reputation of being the best disciplinarian in her district. She consistently has fewer behavior problems than any of her colleagues. What is she doing? She's making her expectations perfectly clear, which means, first, she communicates in simple declarative sentences. She doesn't use 50 words when she could use 10. The more words you use to communicate your expectations, the less confident you sound. Second, she prefaces her instructions to her students with authoritative phrases like, I want you to, and it's time for you to. She says, it's time for you to take out your math books and turn to page 25, as opposed to, let's take out our math books and turn to page 25, okay? Third, this teacher does not explain the motives behind her instructions to her students. Why? because she knows that explanations invite arguments. Whenever parents tell me they're dealing with an argumentative child, I know that these well-intentioned people are explaining themselves. They tell their child why they want him to pick up his toys, for example, and he argues, because you can always pick apart an explanation. If you don't explain yourself when you give an instruction to a child, then the child, being a child, is almost surely going to ask for one. He's going to ask, why? Or, why not? At which point, get ready for a big surprise. Your answer should be, because I said so. These very useful four words, and no, they will not cause psychological damage to your kids. Quite the contrary are a simple but powerful affirmation of the legitimacy of your authority. Say it calmly. Don't scream it. Nothing good is ever accomplished by a person who screams. Last but certainly not least, when giving instructions to a child, do not, let me repeat, do not bend down to the child's level. Getting a child to do what he or she is told is a matter of looking and acting and talking like you have complete confidence in your authority. Bending down to a child's level does not look authoritative. It looks, in fact, like you're one movement away from being down on your knees in front of a king. I know you've read somewhere that you should get down to a child's level when you talk to him. Well. All I can tell you is that there's a lot of really bad parenting advice out there, and that's but one example. Speak to children from an upright position. That causes them to look up to you, and that is a good thing for them and for you both. I'm John Rosemond, author and family psychologist for Prager University.
Hey everyone, this is Alicia Kraus at the new and improving PragerU headquarters in Los Angeles. Thanks so much for tuning into this edition of PragerU Live. Don't forget that our lives and our videos are always free because of generous donors like yourself. So please consider donating today. Even $5 makes a huge difference, especially to reach young millennials like myself, who uh, are the majority of our audience. Today, we are really excited to be joined by nationally syndicated columnist and a best-selling author of parenting books. He's also a twice PragerU presenter. Today, he talks about how to get your kids to listen, which I know lots of parents heading into summer break are going to be uh, really riveted and paying attention to. I've even shared it with friends of mine that are single and don't have kids, and they're like, oh my God, this is so true. I love this. John Roseman. John, thanks so much for being with us today. Oh, thanks for inviting me. It's truly, truly my pleasure. I so appreciate it. So your first video for Prager, you talked about the power of vitamin N. And I think that there uh, should be watched probably in conjunction, by the way, that has almost 3 million views on our, our PragerU.com, so people should go check it out. And today's video, you talk about how to get your kids to listen, but it was almost more about obeying. Uh, is listening a part of obeying? Well, um, I don't know that I use the term listen, um, but I think in the in the vernacular, the current parenting vernacular to listen for a child to listen means uh, or is equivalent to obedience. So um, I think that, uh, yeah, what I was talking about, uh, what I am talking about on that latest uh, PragerU video is how to get kids to obey. Um, I travel the country nine months a year, uh, pretty well coincides with the school year hmm. in my guise as a public speaker on parenting and family matters. And um, I don't hide in the green room before the talk and, I'm, and I don't retire to the green room afterwards. I'm out in the lobby and talking to people. And this is the way I keep what I call a finger on the pulse of parenting in America. So I claim, and I think it's probably a legitimate claim, to talk to more parents on an annual basis about child rearing matters than anybody else in the United States. And the number one question is, how do I get my kids to obey? It's phrased, of course, in a multitude of ways, but it all comes down to that. John. We can't get our children to listen. We can't get our children to do what they're told. Um, and uh, how can we accomplish that? And uh, so, therefore, the PragerU video, which uh, when you guys were discussing the various topics with me, mm -hmm. I felt like a video on obedience was probably uh, more needed than anything else, along with vitamin N, of course. But, so, uh, so at what point then, I'm, I'm a mother of a three and a half year old, I'm eight months pregnant with my second, and at what point do you think a child should be able to understand and comprehend, and at what point should parents really start instilling the necessity for their child to obey what they say? Uh, children can understand fundamental instructions uh, as young as 12 months, hmm. which um, m most parents underestimate the ability of children because the child isn't usually talking by 12 months. Mm -hmm. they, they don't think that communication is possible, but it very definitely is. It may be more of a one-way communication, but the child by age 12 months understands fundamental instructions. Um, let, let's face it, Alicia, a dog by the age of six months, a puppy can understand fundamental instructions. So ask yourself, why not a much more intelligent human being? So you think that parents should start instilling in their children the necessity to obey as, as young as a year old? Well, I think parents should begin expecting obedience as young as 12 months, yes. But, but remember, at the age of 12 months, we're talking about just fundamental instructions. Mm -hmm. um, sit down, uh, hold my hand, mm -hmm. things like that. Um, but yes, I think that 
the earlier you begin expecting obedience. Now, that's different from the way you phrased it. You said instilling in their children, and I would use the word expect and maintain okay. the is a qualitative difference there yes so when do you start instilling it you should you just said that you should start expecting it around 12 months so when should parents start instilling it in their children what do you mean by instilling so at what point do i so when my daughter was six months old i stressed like please and thank you even though she couldn't say please and thank you so then when she started talking a little bit after a year she already knew that please and thank you were things that i expected of her correct mm -hmm. So I started instilling it in her at, at six months old. So at what what steps can parents and even grandparents, because I mean, let's face it, a lot of grandparents watching today are, I think also a whole family is a part of a child's discipline uh, and, and how they are raised to obey. So what steps can those parents and grandparents take and at what age to make sure that down the line when they're expecting obedience from their child, they've already put in the effort and the work that's necessary to get them to obey? Well, you know, modeling, describing, uh, things like that. But when, uh, when people are talking about how do I get my child to obey, it's usually a child who's um, two and a half <laughs> and older, who pretty well understands most things that you're communicating, 98% of the things that you're communicating and uh, is also responding verbally to your instructions and the decisions that you make. Mm -hmm. And that's where, that to me, is where the parenting rubber, if you will, hits the road. That's where parents begin having difficulty. Um, because today's parents, to cut to the chase, believe that obedience is all a matter, or obtaining obedience from a child is all a matter of using consequences correctly, hmm. which is a post-1960s understanding of the disciplinary process. Um, discipline may involve using consequences at times, but that is not fundamentally how you get a child to pay attention to you and to do what you tell him to do. I noticed that one of the things, and it's fascinating to me because I felt like it always kind of bothered me when I would see teachers or people in authority, um, specifically parents, kind of get on eye level with the child and explain to little Bobby why he shouldn't have done what he just did on the playground and how it hurt someone else's feelings. And you break that down in this video and you say part of a way to get a child to obey you is making them look up to you. Uh, can you explain that a little bit? Well, figuratively uh, and literally, children need to look up to adults. And uh, the, the, um, <laughs> one of the things that I tell people, that it, it sort of pops their eyes wide open when I say it, is that you need to act like a superior being. <laughs> and be, because... Show no you know, signs of weakness. <laughs> well, that's not exactly it. Uh, it. It's not lording it over the child. It's not uh -huh. being threatening. It's simply acting like a superior being. Mm -hmm. And of course, if you really understand what that means, then you understand that that means you are calm, you are relaxed, you are easygoing, you are matter of fact, uh, you're not stressed at all. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things that is involved in acting like a superior being is speaking to children from a fully upright position. The, um, the idea that parents should get down to their children's level when they speak to them, um, and that being a somehow a sign of respect mm -hmm. um, or a means of communicating to the child that, he doesn't have to obey because you're bigger. Um, that idea became rooted in America's parenting culture in the 1970s and the early 1980s, as far as I can tell, tracing it back. And if you look at the posture, the parent is in a pleading posture. He looks like or she looks like uh, she's one movement away from being down on her knees in front of the king. <laughs> and because the body posture is pleading, 
uh, 99.9% of the time, if you listen to what the parent is saying, if you listen to their tone of voice, it is a pleading tone of voice. And it always or almost always ends with okay Mm -hmm. with a question mark. Uh, Billy, it would really help mommy out if you would. It, it's it's asking, it's suggesting, and I keep saying to parents, look, that that in and of itself is the problem. You're not communicating from that posture. You're not communicating in that tone of voice. You're not communicating with your words anything more than a suggestion. You lead off with an explanation. Honey, my girlfriend has come back from vacation and wants to show me her pictures and she'll coming, she's coming over and she'll be here in 10 minutes and I want to serve her coffee and pastries and talk to her in this room. And it would really help mommy out if you would pick up these toys and move them somewhere else. Will you do that for mommy? Okay. Yeah. You talked about, I mean, that was almost 50 words right there. And in the video, you also mentioned to use 10 words instead of 50 because explaining to a child it, it is going to create an environment of them then questioning you, which leads to an inevitable argumentative child. Yeah, you see, most of this stuff came out of the 60s and 70s. The hmm. psychological community, and I am a psychologist, and I know this very well. I was there when it was happening mm-hmm. um, in graduate school. Uh, the psychological community maintained that children should be given reasons when parents gave instructions or made decisions, communicated decisions. Mm -hmm. And what I have subsequently discovered, both with my own children and uh, through work with other parents, is that explanations lead almost invariably to argument. The child grabs a hold of the explanation and begins to figuratively shake it, trying to find some weakness in the explanation. So using the example I just gave, the child is likely to come back with, but I was here first, why do I have to move? And besides, (laughs) you won't let me eat in here and you should have to follow the same rules. No, I'm not gonna move. You should meet with your girlfriend in the kitchen. And And the parent comes to me at a speaking engagement and says, John, I've got an argumentative child. And I go, no, you don't. No, you don't. I already know what the problem is. Oh, what's the problem? You're explaining yourself. Hmm. Well, isn't that what I'm supposed to do? Right. This is what the psychological community said beginning in the late 1960s. And this has become, this idea has become embedded in America's parenting culture. But today's parents, they don't understand it. And especially Millennial age parents, Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, on up to age 45, don't understand that prior to the 1960s, parents didn't give explanations. And I keep saying to parents, you are not obligated to justify your authority to your children. Your authority is natural. So whenever my three and a half year old asks why, it's totally okay for me to say, because I said so. Absolutely. That is what, <laughs> no, that is what you should say. Okay. Not, not, is it okay for me to say, Elisha, you should, you should say that. And what is that? It is nothing more than an affirmation of the legitimacy of your authority. It shouldn't be screamed. It shouldn't be snarled. Mm-hmm. It shouldn't be said with a paddle or a belt in your hand. You know, it's just, well, because I said so. Mm-hmm. No, it's just relaxed. And and it, I keep saying to parents, look, you, you're under a lot of stress. Parenting has become the single most stressful thing a woman will do in her entire adult life. So, uh, gosh, hashtag a, mommy wars. Pardon me? I said hashtag mommy wars. <laughs> I'm not, yeah, I'm not familiar with that, but... Uh, it, is that some sort of Twitter thing? I don't, I don't Well, it's just, it's the judgment and the thought pieces of like women judging other women and how they mother and whether they work or whether they stay at home or whether they bottle or whether they breastfeed, whether they had a C-section or natural birth. It's, it's a thing. Uh, oh, <laughs> I call, I call it the good mommy club, you know, the uh-huh. good mommy club. And it's, it's defined by a set of doctrine. And one of the doctrine is 
you will explain yourself to your child. And one of the doctrine is mm -hmm. that you will not say because I said so. And mm -hmm. one of the doctrine is you will bend over into this ridiculous position when you talk to your child and so on and so forth. But uh, the, the government says, because I said so to me, I'm an, you know, I'm a self-employed. The government says, because I said so to me four times a year, mm -hmm. the government's, uh, the, the, uh, you know, various government agencies say, because I said so to me all the time. It, when I was not self-employed, my employer said, because I said so. And I don't mean they use these words, these four words. I mean that people in position of legitimate authority do not feel the need to justify mm. all, their authority to the people over whom they have legitimate authority. And the same is true of parents. Parents out there who are listening to this, look, your authority is natural. Your authority is legitimate. You would make the ultimate sacrifice for your child. Mm -hmm. Dig this. Your child would not make the ultimate sacrifice for you. This is not a relationship between equals. You are the superior being in the relationship. Your child's life and well-being depends on you. Because I said so is nothing more than an affirmation of the legitimacy of your authority. And by the way, the research done by Diana Baumrind at the University of California mm -hmm. is clear that obedient children are the happiest children. Well, I can't think of a better way to wrap up this PragerU Live with John Roseman. Thank you so much. I've definitely learned a lot. I'm sure our viewers have as well. And everyone should be sure to go to PragerU.com or check out on this Facebook page your latest PragerU video. And uh, congrats on that being up. And we really appreciate your time today. Well, you guys and Dennis, you guys are the best. Uh, love you all and, and really respect the work you're doing in culture. Keep it up. And thank you very much. Thank you so much. And if you've enjoyed this Facebook uh, Live here at PragerU Live, please be sure to like and share it. And don't forget to donate because of generous donations from people like you. We're able to reach more millennials you know, who apparently, like myself, need some really important parenting tips so we don't ruin a generation of youngins. And uh, keep those videos free. Reach more people. Even $5 makes a big difference. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. I, this is Alicia Krause from the PragerU HQ signing off. I want to tell you about an essential vitamin you've probably never heard of. If you're a parent or plan to be one, it might be more important to your child's growth than all other vitamins combined. And only you, a parent, can provide it. I call it vitamin N, the word no. More and more children I find are suffering from vitamin N deficiency. And they, their parents, and our entire culture are paying the price. Let me illustrate my point with a story that's quite typical. A father, I'll call him Bill, gave his son, age five, pretty much everything the little boy asked for. Like most parents, Bill wanted more than anything for his son to be happy, but he wasn't. Instead, he was petulant, moody, and often sullen. He was also having problems getting along with other children. In addition, he was very demanding and rarely, if ever, expressed any appreciation, let alone gratitude, for all the things Bill and his wife were giving him. Was his son depressed, Bill wanted to know? Did he need therapy? His son, I told him, was suffering the predictable ill effects of being overindulged. What he needed was a healthy and steady dose of vitamin N. Overindulgence, a deficiency of vitamin N, leads to its own form of addiction. When the point of diminishing returns is passed, and it's passed fairly early on, the receiving of things begins to generate nothing but want for more things. One terrible effect of this is that our children are becoming accustomed to a material standard that's out of kilter with what they can ever hope to achieve as adults. Consider also that many, if not most, children attain this level of affluence not by working, sacrificing, or doing their best, but by whining, demanding, and manipulating. So in the process of inflating their material expectations, we also teach children that something can be had for next to nothing. Not only is that a falsehood, 
It's also one of the most dangerous, destructive attitudes a person can acquire. This may go a long way toward explaining why the mental health of children in the 1950s, when kids got a lot less, was significantly better than the mental health of today's kids. Since the 50s, and especially in the last few decades, as indulgence has become the parenting norm, the rates of child and teen depression have skyrocketed. Children who grow up believing in the something for nothing fairy tale are likely to become emotionally stunted, self-centered adults. Then, when they themselves become parents, they're likely to overdose their children with material things. The piles of toys, plushies, and gadgets one finds scattered around most households. In that way, overindulgence, a deficiency of vitamin N, becomes an inherited disease. An addiction passed from one generation to the next. This also explains why children who get too much of what they want rarely take proper care of anything they have. Why should they? After all, experience tells them that more is always on the way. Children deserve better. They deserve to have parents attend to their needs for protection, affection, and direction. Beyond that, they deserve to hear their parents say no far more often than yes when it comes to their whimsical desires. They deserve to learn the value of constructive creative effort as opposed to the value of effort expended whining, lying on the floor, kicking and screaming, or playing one parent against the other. They deserve to learn that work is the only truly fulfilling way of getting anything of value in life, and that the harder they work, the more ultimately fulfilling the outcome. In the process of trying to protect children from frustration, parents have turned reality upside down. A child raised in this topsy-turvy fashion may not have the skills needed to stand on his or her own two feet when the time comes to do so. Here's a simple rule. Turn your children's world right side up by giving them all of what they truly need, but no more than 25% of what they simply want. I call this the principle of benign deprivation. When all is said and done, the most character-building two-letter word in the English language is no. Vitamin N. Dispense it frequently. You'll be happier in the long run, and so will your child. I'm John Rosemond, author and family psychologist for Prager University.